Hey everyone, welcome to MVVM in practice. I know all of you were at the party last night, right? You got to check out the cool show, The Breakpoints. Uh, they had a good song about MVC last night and it kind of reinvigorated me on MVC and I'm kind of into it now. So I'm really hoping that my own talk will kind of reconvince me to go back to uh, looking at some better design patterns like MVVM, for example. And before I get started, I did want to say that uh, you know, and there's no Bible for MVVM and iOS. It's definitely a, uh, something that everyone kind of does differently. And so this, is, this talk will be kind of about my experiences with MVVM and my opinions. But hopefully by the end of that, you will be able to take what you've learned here and apply that to your own apps and uh, you know, make your own decisions. And then maybe you can come back to this conference next year, speak on it, and prove me wrong. Uh, and with that said, let's start with where we currently are with MVC. So in the world of iOS, we all know that MVC is king. Um, from the minute that we started developing on iOS, we were pretty much told that MVC was the only way to go. It was more, uh, it wasn't an option. It's just the only way to go. So let's look at what we currently have. You've all seen this before, the uh, standard MVC diagram, uh, except this one has the sexy ray green color on it. But uh, let's see, uh, we have the model here on the right side. And you know the model. It, it just holds like it could just be a struct with some properties. It's just the basic data layer for your uh, views. You have the view on the left side there, which is what the user interacts with, and it basically displays information from the from the model and the controller, which is the intermediary between the two. So uh, in this scenario, the controller owns both of those, and it communicates with them. For example, with the model through KVO or delegation, and the view through user interaction with buttons and actions and things like that. But we all know that, I mean, this sounds great in theory, but we all know that that's not usually the case. What we normally have is something like this. Uh, the view and the controller become much more tightly coupled. They become pretty much the same thing. And we have the model, which, is the, which stays the same. And you know, the reason for this is as we've kind of developed as an iOS community and our frameworks have been changing, uh, and now that we have the use of storyboards a lot more, the view and the controller are basically the same thing. Our view controllers are just, uh, they're so tightly bound with our views that it's really hard to distinguish between them in most cases. So this is what we normally have, and we know, all know that it leads to pretty terrible, ugly code. So what is MVVM? MVVM takes very similar ideas as MVC. You can see it still has the three uh, different components. Uh, and let's take a look at each one. The model stays the exact same. It's still just our, our basic data layer. We have the view on the left side, which I put in parentheses controller, because we're just, for all intents and purposes, we're going to assume that you know, the view and the controller are the same thing for this talk. So if you ever hear me say view or view controller or controller, I'm probably talking about the same thing, just interchangeably. Uh, the new object is the view model. And that's kind of the new intermediary between the two other objects. And this is the bread and butter for, for MVVM. And so if you look now, its main job is to take the model's data and basically convert that to a human readable format or human consumable. And it's very app specific. So it's basically taking that raw data and putting it in a format. You can think of it as a converter kind of or a formatter for the view to consume. And if you look at the arrows, rather than the middle object owning both others, there's kind of a nice line from yellow down and then updating back. So it's a very straight line rather than everything being able to talk to each other. And uh, let's look at its responsibilities really, qu really quickly. So the view, obviously, is presentation and user interaction. So it allows uh, the user to be able to see the data that's underlined and also be able to edit it through, um, through interactions. And the view model, again, is just presentation logic. So you can think of it, I, I do really like to think of it as kind of a formatter or a converter. And that's all it's really doing is uh, doing the very app-specific responsibilities. You have the model object. That's just business logic. Um, same thing as M MVC, so nothing really changes there. And what is the problems that it's solving? Well, MVC, or the massive view controller, this joke's been done a lot, so don't expect any laughs on that one. But uh, it's really true. M MVC has terribly massive view controllers whenever you do it, and it's pretty much the, uh, pretty much makes all of our code bases disgusting, and it happens. The testability is really improved. So I'll show you a little example later on. But when you're putting all this app logic inside of your view models, that whole file basically becomes testable now. And it's really awesome. So now you don't even have to think about testing your view controllers, really. The code organization, so again, being able to split things up, what MVC is actually trying to accomplish, that's a huge benefit. And code reusability. If you're um, doing things 
with view models, now you can kind of interchange which view model a view controller does, and it should completely change the look uh, and potentially feel of your app without actually having to change any lines of code. They're kind of interswappable, which is really nice. Uh, the limitations of the cons, there always is, right? There's no, no perfect answer. So it requires binding. We're going to be talking about that a little bit later, but MV MVVM uh, requires binding at the core, and iOS doesn't really give us that, so we have to have some clever workarounds to be able to implement it. There's a potential for boilerplate code, so uh, it gets really frustrating when you actually have to you know, start a new thing, and then you have to create all these other files and do all the connections. Our standard practice would just be like throwing it all into a controller, making sure it works, and then going from there. So that kind of can be frustrating for some people. And it's overkill for simple views. So again, if you have a very simple like cell or something, it feels really weird to make a view model when really you just want to have its data and do its thing. And uh, it doesn't cover every case. But MVC also doesn't cover every case, so we're not losing anything there. So that's fine. Um, and with that said, we're going to get started with demo one. Uh, so what we're going to be working on is a project that I got my hands on through uh, some practices that I won't speak of. I actually got it from the NSA. And so we're going to be working on um, kind of fixing it up, because unfortunately, my hacking skills aren't what they used to be. And when I was getting it, some of the files got corrupted. So we're going to actually have to go through and fix some of those. But while we're doing it, we're going to be implementing MVVM patterns, uh, You know, because obviously, the government put everything in one view controller. They're not very efficient. Um, so why is that? Yeah. <laughs> so uh, all right, so if everyone wants to open up their uh, starter project, so it's in the 306 session, demo one starter, and then the MVVM, MVVM.exco project. All right, it looks good. All right, um, so let's just run it really quick before we even look at anything, just so we can see what it currently does and what state it's in. All right, cool, nice little government animation there. Um, it looks like we have a login screen here with some corrupted data down at the bottom. Um, oh, I should say, I guess I didn't say it from the slide, but the username and password from now on is, is going to be my name, E. Kearney, and then the password is Swift, so I'll, I'll keep doing that, but it, I'll keep saying it uh, for you. But let's see. Let's see what happens. So let me just type in my name and then like jump gibberish for the password. All right, cool. So it still does validation. And we'll type in Swift, authenticate, cool. But interesting, it doesn't show us potential threats in the area right now, so there must be something wrong with it. So let's just log out. All right. So let's just move from there. Let's open the project up and kind of explore what we're looking at. So we have the login view controller in the controllers folder. That's obviously this first page. Um, we're going to be, it seems to work for the most part, so we're going to actually just kind of refactor this. And I think one of the most important steps of MVVM when starting off is just to be able to refactor code you already have rather than just starting something new. So I think that's really powerful. So I think that would be a good place for us to start. Uh, one thing before we get going is something got messed up in the, when setting up these projects for you guys. There's an empty folder called View Models, and the path for it is all messed up. And rather than walking through fixing it, I'm just going to say delete it so that you're not tempted to put something in there later. It'll break. Um, besides that, let's, let's get going. So we have this big login view controller. It has a lot of you know, constants, users. Um, it handles keyboard dismissing, so user interaction. It has text field delegates for uh, being able to change the data based on what the user enters in text fields, and uh, some validation logic and API logic at the bottom. Um, all pretty standard stuff, but you can notice the file still is like 176 lines. It's pretty big for how simple it does, or for, for how simple it is. And so uh, let's see what we can do. So the first step for us is going to be creating a view model for this class. So I'm just going to put it in the main folder, create a new file, a Swift file. I'm going to call it uh, user, user view model. Cool. Um, now that we have this file, I'm actually going to open up uh, the login view controller in the assistant editor by holding Option and clicking login view controller. So you should have them side by side. Let me close this. All right, looks good. OK, so for creating our view model, I'm going to create a class called user view model. Just empty right now. And uh, in our login view controller. Let me go to the top. You can see pretty much everywhere we're going to enter code, there's a to-do there. 
Um, I don't know, somehow the corrupted data added to do's on where it got corrupted, so that's cool. Um, so right here, we're gonna create a private var view model is equal to user view model. So now that our class has a view model, we can start moving things to it. So if you look right below where we just defined the view model, we have these constants here. We have constants for validation, and we also have the user data model. So if we look at the data model really quick, what it is, it's just a username and a password, that's it. It's just a struct, so very simple. But we can actually just move all three of those to our view model, so let's cut those out, get rid of the to-do, and move those right into our view model. So that's a good place for it, right, because this is very app-specific information. If our product or our design comes back and says, like, oh, now, now we actually need to have a seven-character password length or something, it's something that the view controller shouldn't have to deal with. It's something that the view model would. Um, all right, so now, now that we have the user in there, the view, the view controller doesn't have access to any of its information. So we're gonna expose information by making some properties. So let's create a username property of type string, and all it's gonna do is return the user.username, and then we'll do the exact same for password. It's also a string, and we'll return user.password. All right, great, so now our view controller will have access to those when it needs, that's cool. Um, there's one more thing that we'll need to expose. So if you look back at the app, when I type in my name, eKerny, and I press enter to go to the next line, it actually stars out everything except for the last three letters. So we'll actually want to expose that and do that logic in our view model. So we'll create a property called uh, protected username, which is also a string. And rather than implementing that, if we go to our view controller and scroll to the bottom, you'll see that there is a method called protected username that takes a username and does all its magic to it. Let's actually just take all of the contents of that method, take those out, and we copy them, remove that empty method, and we're just gonna put the contents of that into our protected username. All right, our protected username. Uh, Property, cool, no problems there. Um, so now that we've exposed all the data that we need for our view controller, we're gonna go back and uh, add some methods to our view model for being able to edit that data. Because right now, it's, there's no use. We would actually always just have empty data at this point. So let's add some, um, some methods. So we'll create an extension. I think it's good in view models to always have an extension for your setters and getters and things like that. So. We'll create a method called, or for updating the username, called, let me get this down. All right, called update username. It'll take in a username string. And inside of that, we're just gonna do user.username is equal to username. And again, we have to expose this because if you look, our user is private, so they don't have access to that from the outside but this gives them away. We're gonna do the exact same thing for the password, update password. It's gonna take a password string and set the user's password to that password. Okay, so uh, now that we have all the setters and getters done for our view model. I mean, that's pretty much it for there for the most part. We can go back to our view controller and start fixing some of the errors. So if we go to our UI text field delegate on the right here, all right, um, you'll see our first error. We're, right now we're setting the text field equal to the model's username, but since that doesn't exist anymore, we need to replace that with our view model, oops, view model dot username, right? So it's just being able to access that and we'll move down to the next method for when the text field did begin editing. So this will help us uh, star out the username when that happens. So rather than using this method that we got rid of, we can actually just do uh, our view model, view model dot, what is it, update username, and whoops, and get rid of, sorry. That was a confusing way of doing that. but. Uh, what am I doing? Changed it to a property protected user. Oh, right. 
Wait, what? Text will debut. Update, oh, the new, oh, I did it in the wrong spot. You're right, you're right, you're right, you're right. Um, Textfield.txt is equal to view model dot protected username. Thank you. Get rid of the to-do. All right, so now we're gonna move down to our text field should change characters and range. So this is what's actually gonna be updating the view model with the new data, right? Uh, so right now we have user dot username is equal to new string. Uh, what we're gonna actually replace that with is our view model dot update username and put the new string in there. Get rid of the to-dos as you go along. And then we're gonna do the exact same thing for the password field so that we can keep that up to date. View model dot update password. And then new string. All right, so now our data should be, our data should be up to date with uh, <laughs> the slow Coke can opening. <laughs> <laughs> all right, uh, all right, so now that we've gotten that all done, um, we need to actually start looking at our validation. So validation is one of those things that shouldn't be done by the view controller, because again, it's, it's very data specific, or app specific. So we're gonna move that to the, uh, the view model now. So if you look, we have this user validation enum. We're just gonna get that out of there and move it to our view model to the top. And, uh, and then we'll move our validate function, our method, out of here and to our view model. All these things work perfectly because we're still using the same user uh, model within our other class, so let me make this bigger. And that'll fix that. So we got our validation in there, and the last, last little bit, and I know, I know this is just a lot of copy and pasting and stuff, but it's pretty much what you're gonna be doing, is, uh, is moving our our actual login method to there. So this is, there's a little bit of a debate here on where our login logic should, should lie. Uh, a lot of people think it should be in the view model, some people make their own classes, some people still think it can go into the controller. Uh, I personally don't think it should go into the controller, uh, and putting it in the view model makes it really easy for you to be able to change what service you're actually logging in with, so for testing and things like that. So we're gonna copy and paste the login method out of this extension, we might as well get rid of it now, to the bottom of our view model class. And that's all the logic that we're gonna put in the view model for now. And the only thing that's broken now is if we go up to our authenticate uh, action. And again, actions are great for our view controller because they should respond to the, uh, to the view, or what the user is actually doing. So what we're gonna do instead is just change this to view model dot validate and view model dot login. All right, um, so now, Let's, uh, let's see what happens. I think that that should be good. So if we build and run now, our app's still logged in. Let's see if I just type nothing in. Awesome, it's still validating. If I type in eKerny and Swift, we log in, so it's still working. So again, nothing really changed from the outside, but let's take a look at what we actually accomplished. Our view model now takes care of all the logic for our app, and really within our view controller, it's still just take, setting up the UI. It uh, um, has the text field delegate there, which makes sense from being a view, and all that's doing is using the view model to set some things, and that's pretty much it. So now our, our bigger class is down to basically its core components and uh, our view model is now definitely reusable and in a good state. And so uh, I think that's it for this and I know it's very basic right there but it's just a good step in kind of seeing the process of going between the two. And in the next demo we're gonna be going into some binding and some more uh, impressive things, so some, some <laughs> more worthwhile things. So let's uh, go back into our slides here. Or I guess we should, uh, is there time for questions? I guess it's not much of a question, but uh, more of a request. Can mm -hmm. you slow down just a little bit? Sure, that, and in that one, that was Thank a lot you. of copy and pasting and stuff, so uh, sorry about that, but we had to get through it to get to some more interesting topics. So yeah, if, if you have the slides, definitely go back and check them during this break if we have one. Hi, um, why are you using a class instead of a struct for the user view model? Uh, the reason I did that in this case is that I do think that uh, 
the B model has a lot of potential for actually holding state, and I might actually want that to be synced between multiple classes if I happen to be passing it around. So an example would be like if it's a table view and I had view models for each cell, I might actually want that view model to be held at the uh, view controller level. So in a lot of cases, like yeah, I'm, I'm a guy that always is pushing for strux, uh, but in this case with view models, I tend to make them classes just for that reason because sometimes data if it's actually holding and storing some data you can get some issues there um, but again yeah you can always start off making a struct at the beginning until it doesn't work right that's kind of the way that I like to look at them so uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the model view presenter that's like more prevalent on Android how would you describe the, um, maybe the two main differences be between model view model and model view presenter uh, so I don't off the top of my head, I don't know the, I, I've looked at Model View Presenter, but not enough right now to, in front of all of you, say anything intelligent about it. But what I will say is that a lot of these design patterns use very similar concepts, and at the core, they're really just trying to break up your code. And so, I mean, I think any of these are, be are better than what we currently do. Uh, I mean, Viper is like another technique that I know a lot of people use. Uh, so, yeah, sorry I can't answer you right now on that, but anything's better. <laughs> hey, uh, so, I noticed that you still have, or you have a lot of I, uh, interface builder, like IB Action, IB Outlet stuff in the view controller. Uh, do you see people who don't use storyboards, who do all the view like stuff in code, getting the same benefits out of doing MVVM? That's a good question. Um, so I mean, I, th I feel like MVVM came kind of like how I said before, because now we're so reliant on storyboards and interface builder that the view controller has just become that. But if you're doing things through code, then it would make more sense to actually have a view that is doing that kind of stuff, and the view controller is just kind of orchestrating, creating that. Uh, but I still do think that you can like definitely use MVVM for those practices. You'd probably just have an additional file rather than having it all in the one, one place. But it still helps for code reusability and breaking it up. So when you have, um, so this view model is actually really great. Um, my question is sort of, if you have multiple view models, like you're in a table cell or table view controller or something like that, and you have to do an operation that you know, uh, uses a bunch of view models and it's a network operation, does that, does that logic sort of sit in the view controller then, because it's not really part of one view model? Or is there like a super view model that sort of collect, um, manages the collection of view models? or? Yeah, I mean, I have, so that's kind of the issue that I come across with uh, table views, for example, and you'll get that in the lab a little bit. But, uh, I mean, for example, in the view controller there, you might have a view model for the controller that has, I've done this before, like where it has an array of view models in it for each cell to use, right? So the top level view model is able to say like how many cells there are and all those kind of things. Um, but the actual uh, view models to display information will be in there. And so, yeah, the view controller doesn't have to do the logic in that, it just has the one thing and that view model, it's, it's job to expose all the right properties and all the right methods to be able to interact with those other ones. Hey, um, <clears throat> maybe a tool like this already exists, but I was just thinking a great tool would be a sort of static analyzer that it reads your code and advises you, you know, which which pattern to move your particular part of your code into. You know, so if you could, you know, click a button and say, give me an MVVM, and it would read your your horrible MVC code, <laughs> you <Yeah>. know? <laughs> yeah, that sounds like a great so tool you should work a, on that. There's a project for somebody. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll definitely star that one. I'd like to use it when you wrote it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Did you have one more? There's one right Um, so kind of tagging along the questions that they had back there, and when you mentioned the login logic uh, with the debate of that going into the view model, uh, when I've been looking at MVVM, one of the hard things that, because uh, I see it, everybody do it differently, is what do you put in the view model? Because there's business logic, there's service logic, right. there's action, reaction, and to my understanding, the core concept is anything that manipulates the view should right. go into the view model to make it as generic as possible. Right. And then you can have a service layer to do the rest. So my, my question to you is how do you identify what should go in the view? It was even mentioned earlier like an IB action, right. and I feel like that's an action reaction type of thing. So it should be like the view controller controls the action, and then you get a reaction where if it needs to display something, it gets it from the view model. Yeah, um, that's... And part of it is what he just said, it's identifying 
specifically right. in writing <laughs> what kind of code it is. Yeah. Right? Yeah, that's the big that's the big deal with that is I mean identif identifying it is you know one of the hardest parts at the beginning right because um, knowing what should go where is pretty much the core of making this work better mm -hmm. but um, you know with that I, I agree I don't think that the way that I have it this is for the demo is just having the actual logic of the uh, API inside of there but yeah I do agree that there should actually be more of another object that's doing that and you can use like protocols for being able to swap in and out which API methods are being called from a view model. So the view model shouldn't really be tied down deep with the API like that. But I see what you're saying about you know actions not being like this action and reaction thing. And uh, there are ways, and we'll talk about you know different functional ways of doing that. But I think that in iOS, starting at the place of just keeping IB actions and changing the least amount will help you to actually organize code in a better way and moving forward. But, okay. <clears throat> All right, we're going to get going again and get into a little bit more of the interesting stuff. So again, yeah, a lot of that stuff we just covered was like duh uh, to most of us, but also it's not what most of us are doing. Most of us, I think, write pretty ugly code sometimes. Um, so let's hop into data binding. So coming from the iOS world, uh, a lot of people probably don't know what data binding is, so we're going to just cover that really quick and jump into a little bit of a good demo just uh, showing us how that works. Uh, so let's look at what data binding is. Uh, so at the core, what it really is is a connection between the UI and the business logic. Uh, it, that connection should be kind of automatic, you can think about it. So for example, uh, you're basically linking the UI to a certain model object through the view model. And what that means is that anytime that the data changes in the model, the UI will automatically update. Right, because they're linked because of that. And so a little easy example would be you look at a counter object here. It has a count property, that's just an int. And then we have a method called increment count. All it's gonna be doing is adding one to the count and then calling itself in a second. So it's just gonna keep incrementing one by one. So if we show that we have a label, we want this label to be synced up with the count property. And all that means is that every time the count updates, or every time the count property updates, we need it to update the label, and then we'll have something moving on like this, right? Pretty simple, but not something that we've directly used before. And then just to go over what two-way binding is, it's just what it sounds like. Changes to the model update the UI, and user input updates the model. So that's just basically linking them both ways. So anything that happens on the UI side would update the model, and in turn, because you updated the model, it would update the UI. Just a little example of that, same class counter. We have a label as before, but now we have an increment button. So when we click that button, it's gonna update the count, which in turn updates the label. Pretty simple. Uh, so how do we do this in Swift? There's a number of ways that people try to make this work because there's no direct way uh, like other languages where you can just set them up in, in some way, in some format that they automatically update each other. And one of the first options is KVO which is not that awesome. And just to remind everyone what it looks like, uh, you have the object to observe. You have to make it NS object and the property dynamic, which kind of gets away from our Swiftier style and we have to actually rely on the framework now. We have our, don't worry about all this code, but it's just to remind you. Uh, you see in the init method we have to add observer and we have to use stringly typed uh, uh, parameters here to actually listen for the property, which of course is terrible and, and in the future can cause crashes or uh, like if we ever change the property name. And then we have this method that we observe value for key path that we actually get the value and we can do something with it, like updating the UI. Uh, and again, we have to do dinit, which also is prone for error. So uh, let's just go on to the next one here. Our next option, because we're not going to do KVO, we don't want to rely on that, would be delegation. Uh, this one, everyone knows, create a protocol. This protocol could define a property change for example, uh, the object to observe declares the, uh, the delegate object, and it'll have a method to be able to update the internal model. And then every time you do that, it's just going to call the delegate and say, hey, something changed. And uh, here's our observer. It's setting itself up for, or the object that's observing. It'll set itself up for a delegate, and it'll do something. So the, the negative of this is it's very robust in the sense that we have to do all this work, and we have to explicitly call the uh, delegate methods at different times. 
the positive though is that we can actually have a lot of control using this. So rather than just having some kind of message that says, hey, the object changed, we can actually very specifically say, hey, the object changed in this way or you know, something like that. You can picture a table view rather than saying all the data changed. We can actually say, like for example, if we we're doing a paging application or something, we can say like, oh, we added data to it, so only so the other object that's listening can actually just update the new data rather than refreshing the whole table view. So that's kind of a positive of delegate of delegation. <clears throat> but we're not going to use that for now. Uh, another option is functional reactive programming, which uh, a lot of you have heard of. Um, some people think it's the future. Some people are very skeptical about it. A lot. Uh, very few in the grand scheme of things are actually using it. Uh, so let's take a quick example of what that looks like. Looks like Chinese. Uh, it's, not, it's not that awesome, and I really didn't feel like making an example for it, so that's what you get. Um, yeah. I personally, oops, I personally don't use it. Uh, I mean, I have on the side, but I haven't used it in production code, so I don't feel comfortable enough actually saying anything. But it definitely solves a lot of these issues that we're talking about, uh, so it's definitely worth a look. And then our last option that we're going to look at, which we'll be implementing now, is property observers. So in this example, you have an object to observe. Foo is what we're trying to listen for. And we can use the property observer did set to actually be able to, uh, to tell our observing object uh, that the data actually changed. And you can see here we create the object, change its value, and we'll get a printout. The one thing you'll see here is that we're actually not actually updating the listener anywhere, right? We're just printing something out. So how can we accomplish that in Swift in a good way that makes us feel like awesome developers? That's called boxing. So just to take a quick look at what a box would look like, uh, you create this class object called box. It's generic. You would have, or at the, um, its value that it would have inside of it is of the generic type. The did set listener right there is what, uh, or I mean property observer is where we'll be notifying the listener and you just create an init method that sets the value. That's like a box at the base level. But you're looking at that and you're like, okay, that doesn't accomplish anything. We're just hiding the value within another thing. Uh, and you know, we use it like that. So the way that we can actually get some real power out of a box is by adding binding to that. So let's take a look at what we currently had. That's the box that we just had before, uh, just with some spaces in between. And what we can add to it now is a listener. So this is just a closure that takes a uh, generic parameter and returns void. The uh, actual, uh, in our value, in the did set property observer, we actually can call that listener now with the new value. And we, we add a method called bind at the bottom. And that bind is just going to pass in a that same kind of listener. It'll set the listener and it'll call it immediately. And the reason that we call it is so picture your view is now binding uh, a property on your view model to some part of the UI. And when it initially binds, rather than waiting for the next update to actually call the, the listener in the did set, it'll actually call it right away so that our, our UI can be synced up with our data from the get-go. So we're going to take a, I mean, we'll actually be implementing this in the lab, so don't worry if it doesn't totally make sense. But the uh, well, that's way at the bottom for you guys in the back. But the uh, boxed int, you just create it like we did before. So right now we're making it a box of type int with 42. When we bind it, we uh, want any time the value changes to actually print out the value changed and print out the new value. So right away it calls itself and it says value changed to 42. If we set it to 100, it'll get called back and say value changed 100. So uh, let's actually see how that works in our demo two. So you can leave off exactly where we left off last time. But uh, if not, if you fell behind because I was going super fast in my speaking, then you can uh, just open up the demo to starter, and you should be good to go. Uh, OK, so we're back where we were. We have our view model on the left and our view controller on the right. Uh, so what we're going to be actually working on is if you look at the app, we have this jumbled up data at the bottom here. We're gonna, what this is supposed to be is kind of a two-factor authentication token. So what it would do is it would generate a token there, and you know, as a government employee, you'd see that, and then you'd actually have to write it in your other government thing to prove that uh, you should be authenticated. So let's 
start implementing that. So we know that our view model has to give us this information, right? So we're gonna go below our protected username here and add a new property called access code. We'll make it uh, optional. And in its did set, just for testing purposes, let's just print out something like access code, just so that we can see when it changes once we get it uh, implemented. So we're just gonna be printing that out. Oh, uh, there. So we're just gonna be printing it out when it updates. Uh, Okay, so how do we add the logic for this? All that got removed from this file. So at the top, where our other constants are, we're gonna add a new constant called private let code refresh time. And we'll just set it equal to 5.0 for now. So that's gonna be how often we're actually gonna be updating the code. And we're just doing it for five seconds. That'd be actually really hard if it was two-factor to be typing that in really fast, but it'll be good for demo purposes. Uh, okay. So now that we have our refresh timer, let's go to the bottom of our project and I'll actually create a new extension just to break things up for uh, user view model. And I will make it private because no one needs to know about this. All right, so what we're gonna be doing here is creating a method that will actually initialize the access uh, token and keep refreshing every five seconds in this case. So we'll create a method called start access, oops, code timer, okay. And all we're gonna be doing in this is calling access code and setting it. And luckily we have a helper for this. We have a login service that we can actually do generate access code, all right? So that's gonna be changing it. But right now it's only doing it once. So what we're gonna do is kind of that same little trick that you saw in the, uh, the counter from the slides is we're just gonna be calling ourselves every five seconds. So we'll just do dispatch, and rather than using the normal dispatch after like that, which takes weird parameters and it's annoying, I made a helper method called dispatch after like this. It takes a number of seconds, so we'll just pass in the uh, code refresh time. And in the block, let's not use autocomplete, no, wait. Let's not use all that. Let's use trailing closure, because that's way cooler. All right, get rid of all that. Um, and inside of here, we're actually gonna do the updating, so all we have to do is call ourselves self.start access code timer. But right now, this does create a retain cycle, and I know sometimes we don't care about that in our demos, but I can't live with myself. There we go. So now, we, if we ever get rid of this login view, we won't have a retain cycle. Uh, Got to make that like that. All right, cool. Um, so let's build and run really quick and just make sure that our access code is working correctly. It should be printing out at the bottom. Oh, it won't yet. We haven't even called it yet. Awesome. All right, so we're going to create a new init method now to actually call it when our code starts. So if you look here below our access code, let's create a new init method and we'll call it uh, init with user so that we can actually do some injection later on in our testing so we can actually set up the user. And we're just gonna do self.user is equal to user. And we'll just do start access code timer. All right, so now, now our access code timer should start and it should be updating. So I'm gonna build and run again. And okay, we see Right there, it changed, that's awesome and nice. All right, so every five seconds it's gonna be changing and generating a new string to end. But right now we still have our jumbled data, our, st our jumbled access code in the app. So how are we gonna keep that label updated with this new value in our view model? Well, we're gonna use binding, our, our box and binding like we just learned. So I'm gonna open up the project navigator and I'm gonna create a new file. We're gonna call it a new Swift file called box. For simplicity, click create. Okay, so now basically what we saw in the slides we're gonna implement and hopefully it'll kind of get more ingrained as going through it, but we're gonna create a box that's generic, right? Then uh, the box needs a listener, so we're gonna type alias that and make it listener, listener, all right. 
we're going to make it a type of generic and return void. So it'll have a parameter that's generic that returns a void. We'll actually have a property for that listener of the listener type. We'll make it optional, so we don't always have to have a listener on a box. It would be pointless to not, but why not? We'll have a variable for the value that's of type T. And in the did set, which is where all the power kind of happens, this is where we're going to be calling the listener object, if it exists, and passing in the new value. So we'll constantly be updating whoever is listening with whatever the new value is. We'll create a just a default init method with, a, let's see, a type T. And it'll do self.value equals value, right? And last but not least, the most important part, we got to have our bind. So bind listener of type listener. We'll make that optional as well so that we can nullify the listener at any point if we want to stop listening. And in here, we do self.listener is equal to listener. And we'll immediately call the listener with whatever the current value is so that the UI can update right off the get-go. And so that's it. Uh, it does some things that maybe we're not used to, but let's kind of look at how we can use that now. Uh, let's go back to our view model. We won't need the, uh, we won't need the box code anymore because that's done. Let's look at our access code. So right now, we're just accessing it uh, from the, the view controller, and it's not a box. So let's actually do that. So if we change the access code code into being a box, so this is how we define it. We're defining the access code as a box of type optional string, so it doesn't have to have a value. We can get rid of all this did set stuff. And let's initialize it with a default value of nil. So it's just a, an empty box right now, but it's still of type string. OK. Now, in our code, we should have an error. So in the start access code timer, it doesn't work anymore. What we have to do is change access code to access code dot value is equal to the login service. So now we're actually setting that box. OK, so now we have that box value, and that's it. We can go to our login view controller, which is here on the right, and go to view did load, for example. And it's time to bind. So what we would do here is do view model dot uh, access code dot bind. And then um, in, inside of this closure is where we'll actually be binding the object, right? So what we do is we do self dot, what is the label called? Code label. So this is that label that has all the junk right now. Uh, dot text is equal to dollar sign zero. So the parameter that's passed in will be setting to the text value. And one important thing, though, with binding is right now our view model is, is owned by this controller, right? And this bind is retaining self. So I, I know that a lot of times we would just use weak, but this is actually a great place for unowned. And the reason for that is because our view model should last at least as long as our view controller, right? It's dependent on that. Um, so we know that it, it, this will break the retain cycle, but it'll stay around as long as we need. All right, so that works. Or that's there. Let's see if it works. Let's do build and run. And hopefully what we'll see is the label automatically updating itself. Oh, it did initially. Let's see if it does it again in five seconds. Nice. All right. So right now, all we did is we set up a bind for our label, and we can do something in there. So you can imagine if you had your view model with a bunch of different properties, you can bind those up to each different element. So in this case, it's a label, and automatically have those syncing. So now, in this case, anytime anything ever changes that value, so if later down the road we end up adding some way that the access code can change from another class, this will automatically stay updated, and we don't have to know that, oh, we have to call some delegate method, or we have to do something to update anyone that's listening. So that's pretty awesome and pretty powerful. Um, one thing, I think since we probably have a little bit of time, um, yeah, since we have some time, I just wanted to show you a little glaring issue that we might have with our view model. So if we look at our view model, um, at the top, you might notice that our username and our password objects are just accessors right now, right? Like the view controller can only 
determine if something changed by keep by keeping on checking on those, right? So it's just gonna have to say like, hey, what's the username right now? What's the username right now? We have no way of updating them if the username actually changed from some other source rather than the view controller. So what we could do, in theory, is make these into boxes as well. But let's look at what happens when we do that. So if we create a box for this username, for example, and let's get rid of the um, information there. Um, okay, cool, so now we have a box which we can now bind to. Let's fix a couple errors. So username.value now. So we always have to get the value of the box rather than the uh, username.value, rather than just using the value itself. All right. And I think if we go to our view controller, there's one more issue. We have to use viewmodel.username.value here. OK, so we fixed the issues. If we build and run right now, uh, nothing, will hap nothing will work, actually. So what we do here is we're going to add the binding code view model dot access code or sorry view model dot uh, what is it username dot bind and we'll actually just inside of here do a print so all we want to do right now is just see every time the username changes so username changed and we'll just print out the past in parameter like that um, OK. And uh, if we run that right now, we say, OK, cool, maybe it'll be changing. Oh, something broke. Uh, oh, I didn't initialize the value. Let's just create a username as a box of empty string. OK. So if I build and run right now, and I open the console, username changed initially, so the initial bind worked. But as I type, nothing's happening. We should be seeing stuff. OK, so the reason for that is that we're never actually updating the username, which is now a stored property, right, rather than just accessing what's in the user. We're never updating it. But one of the cool things, and this is something I use all, all the time, is since our user is a struct, anytime we change one of the username or password uh, properties, it'll actually set a new user, right? It's, it's, uh, it's, it'll copy it. and so. What that means is that in our user object now, we can actually do a did set and do username dot value is equal to the user dot username. So every time in our text field that we update the user, this did set method will actually get called. And it wouldn't if it was a class. So that's a good benefit there. So if we run this now and open our debugger, username changed. And as I'm typing, it'll work. So that's kind of cool. So now we're able to see two different examples, one where we're just using these computed properties to just access the user, and one where we can actually listen to a store property on the view model. So that's pretty powerful and really cool. Um, and I think that's it for there. Um, uh, one other thing I should show, and now that I did all those changes to user, it won't work. But if you look in the NVVM test folder, I have a login test.swift. Uh, class and oops, right now it's all commented out. But what I did is I just made some very basic tests on our view model, and you can check those out and just kind of see how it works. Uh, right now there will be an error because of those last little changes that I just added on with the box. But the cool thing is, is that when using that test, you pretty I think it has like 95 code coverage for this view model now, and we don't actually have to deal with testing our, our view controller because again our view controller is just doing very basic um, basic UI things. We shouldn't really be testing app our uh, UI kit, right? We don't need to know that a label actually presents the text when we set it. So that's really powerful and cool. Um, so check that out. And I think that's it for the demo. Uh, we have time for questions. Yeah. So yeah, just raise your hand if you have a question. I just have a quick question if you can um, elaborate a little bit about using weak versus unknown self. <laughs> sure. We'll just go into a new talk now. Uh, <laughs> uh, so the reason I'm using unowned there, right? So the, the difference is we're breaking the retain cycle by either using weak or unowned. And generally, we use weak when it's OK for the object to become nil at some point throughout the process. But in our case, since we have the view model should always exist while the view exists, right? Like that view model's core to displaying information. We know it will always live there that long. So we use unknown to still break the retain cycle, but uh, 
in a way that kind of saves us. And I know some people are always like, well, why not just use weak all the time, right? But there's actually like a lot of different things. You can read a lot of reports on it and stuff, but um, weak has performance costs in the long run because it makes self optional. And uh, so just generally speaking, when you know that the object's gonna live as long as the retaining object, you should make it unknown. Does that, yeah? So the first option that you uh, dismissed with Swift was uh, KVO, and um, for obvious reasons. But building, especially um, apps for OS X, there's a lot of data binding built into um, Interface Builder. Do you know of a way that that is being used, or is that being looked into as a way to add something into Swift where you can get uh, string bindings um, similar to KVO? Uh, I mean, all these other things that we're talking about with like React and Rx Swift and things like that kind of have their own implementation for doing these binding and things. And those handle all the cases of having the UI be able to bind and using signals to be able to update each other. So I mean, those, those frameworks already kind of do that. I don't know if there's like an active work from Apple to be adding anything like that. I highly doubt that they're focusing on that right now. Um, but the reason I like to show this example of creating your own box rather than using those other frameworks is because uh, I th like going from this to one of those is super helpful and it's a way easier jump because again, if you go just jump into that now, it might look like Chinese to you. And so, uh, yeah, I'm not sure if that totally answers your question, but um, yeah. More questions or are we good? All right, then we can go ahead and start the lab. All right, cool. So let's look here. So in this lab, you're going to be working um, on implementing the second page of, or the second uh, screen of the app. And what that means, is, or that screen is supposed to do, is display a list of all the nearby threats. And I know you're all probably anxious to find out if there's any threats at this conference. I've seen a lot of sketchy speakers walking around. And so I'm curious myself. Uh, so what you'll be using is, Delegation in this case. So again, I want to look at more native approaches to be able to accomplish similar things. So in this case, you're going to use delegation. So again, the negatives were that it's a little bit robust, but at the same time, it gives you a lot more power. So hopefully through using something like a collection view, you'll kind of see how delegation is a good candidate for using, um, using, or sorry, where table views are a good can, table views or collection views are a good candidate for using delegation. Uh, so. Yeah, if you have any questions or anything while you're going through it, um, feel free to raise your hand or come up to me. I'll, I'll try to walk around and help people. Um, yeah, thanks. All right, hey everyone, we're just gonna wrap up really quick here. Uh, hopefully you enjoyed the lab if you got a chance to do that. Um, but I just wanted to wrap everything up before we go and I'll start writing incredible code. So uh, let's just recap really quick what you learned in this session. Uh, the first demo, we learned how to refactor MVC to MVVM, and the point, again, that was very you know, like basic, but that's what you have to go do. Uh, it, I, I think it's actually better for you to just go visit a code base right now that already works, find something simple, take that code and try to refactor it into just in that component using MVVM and making sure that everything works the same way afterward. In doing that, you're gonna start ingraining this thought process in your head and uh, moving forward, it'll be easier, easier for you to just imagine a new part of the app as doing that and implementing it from there straight on. In demo two, you learned about data binding. So this was a basic example. You learned about box and a box and a data binding. Uh, this is something that uh, a lot of different frameworks that I was talking about before are built on is something like this. And I think understanding it at the core is what will really help you move forward because once you understand that data binding and how it works, moving to these other frameworks is way easier. Uh, and it's kind of powerful. You can actually use it for a lot of other things besides MVVM, right? Like I can think of other ways that I would use data binding, or at least the box object in my app uh, for any kind of structure. And then in the lab, you did MVVM with delegation. And that, again, was to kind of show you that we don't need to use all these crazy ways all the time. Like, you can actually just get started using MVVM using some of the practices that we already know. Delegation, everyone here should be very familiar with and comfortable writing in their sleep. So uh, it gives you a lot more control over what messages you can send back and forth. And 
Yeah. Okay, so some of the, just to recap some of the benefits and limitations of MVVM. So first of all, it breaks up your code by responsibility. This is obvious, and that's what all design patterns are trying to do, but I should write that. It simplifies testing. So again, I kind of missed the part where I showed the actual unit test going because I started uh, adding some boxes to some objects that the test didn't have ready. But anyways, it simplifies testing. Now you can focus on not what to test or like when to test. You just get your view model, test that whole thing, and like for the most part, you're pretty good at that point. You don't have to think about creating view controllers in your tests and then somehow making them lay out their subviews and then testing labels and things. That's if you're doing that, you're doing unit testing wrong, I'm sorry. If uh, It also improves code reusability. So again, uh, if you kind of structured your view models in a way where they're using protocols, then you can just be uh, supplying in and out view models for different views at any time, and the view has no idea what it's getting, but all it knows is what it needs to display its stuff, and so that's really cool. And uh, but the limitations, again, because there always are, it requires binding or other workarounds. So we, we saw some of those examples. Uh, it has a potential for boilerplate. We had talked to some people about how at the easy side, when it's a very simple view, like even in my example, it feels weird that you have a user model object with just two properties, and then I'm having to create properties in my view model to just expose those, right? I'm just basically duplicating my work all the way across, and that can feel like a drag. Imagine if our model object had 10 properties or more, which they often do. Uh, so that can feel like a drag, even though it's, it definitely is improving your code base. And then sometimes it feels like overkill. So on the other side, when you get to a big app, it might get so complex. Like I, I know when I first started, I, you know, I read some articles. I felt all cool for MVVM. And then all of a sudden, I started just trying to design like one of the hardest new things in my app to just use that. And I just go crazy. And I made all these objects. And they're all talking and doing stuff. And then like at the end of the day, it was just like, get reset dash dash hard. Like, get rid of it all. Like, it just wasn't working. And so you know, that's where it kind of becomes a problem. And then it doesn't cover every case, but MVC also doesn't cover every case, so we're not losing anything there. Um, where to go from here? Uh, Ash Furrow talks about this a lot. Go check out his blog. That's kind of like where I got started. Looked at some of his blog posts um, to get me going. I think we even have different opinions on some things, so, but that's fine. The whole goal is that you can kind of learn and figure out for yourself what's the best take on everything. Reactive Cocoa or RX Swift, if you dare. So uh, if you speak Chinese or if you uh, just kind of feel like going for it, that's definitely a good place to go. I would recommend that you actually implement it at a base layer, like using the techniques I showed in your apps to have a better understanding before jumping over, and it'll be an easier transition. Uh, go to your own code base. Go work on your own code base right now. Just go refactor like one simple view when you have some time, and um, you'll kind of start seeing some of the benefits. And uh, if you have any questions after this, my Twitter, eKerny, you guys should know that now if you're typing in the password to the uh, code base or in, to the app for a long time. But uh, I think that's it. So yeah, thank you.